All right. Hmm. Yes, no. Oh. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to have a little time, just 10, 10, 12 minutes or so for some questions. Okay, so this is really for both of you, but let's ask Martin first. It says, much of your work features plot twists, and this is you plural, uh, much, of your, much of your work features plot twists and unreliable narrators. How do you manage to maintain this trust relationship between the reader and the writer? That's to say, how do you manage to make the reader distrust the characters or the reality within the novel, as opposed to the portrayal you're giving as the author? Um, well, the convention of the unre unreliable narrator has um, a glorious history. And my favorite bit of unreliable narration comes from the Nabokov novel, Despair, where the narrator's wife has been spending a lot of time with her, with her cousin. And the reader knows that something's going on. And he goes around, his, his wife says, um, I'm at the movies. And he goes around to his cousins and finds that uh, his wife is lying there uh, in her nightdress on the bed. And then um, he, he uh, the cousin, Ardalian, changes, it, lifts up his smock and, and she, he finds he's naked underneath. And he just remarks about, how dirty he is and uh, how he never washes. And then his wife starts to sing a German popular song and he, he, all he notices is, is how badly she pronounces the vowels. <laughs> um, and the reader, is, it, it's, um, it's in fact a very intimate uh, reader-writer convention in that, that it's the, the unobservant narrator. And I don't think there's any conflict at all. It, you soon get the hang of what's happening, and um, it's a deeply in, enjoyable um, way of going at it. Yeah, I think uh, Martin's dead right. Measuring out those rhetorical, readily distances, uh, writer to character, uh, reader automatically getting this. Uh, the hang of uh, how to balance those distances. I mean, even children can do it. Um, free and direct style, for example, which probably got its most sustained first expression in Jane Austen, is actually to describe a very complex matter. And being able to describe in the third person and yet coloring that, that narrative with the subjective feelings of a third-person character. Uh, you'll find now in books directed at you know, six-year-old children, it's got something to do, I think, with the ways in which we are anyway, whether we're writers or not, innately very good at judging each other's uh, intentions, states of mind, what it's like to be the other person. I think the novel is a, a refinement of, of that ability. So I, I, it, it's more difficult to explain and yet somehow easy to do as a reader. Um, and uh, as Martin says, it's one of the delights of, I think, of, of being a writer is to measure that out, make those calculations. Okay, uh, there's a question here which, actually there have been two or three questions like this, so I'll try to run them into one, about, about the relationship, essentially the, the relationship between where you live and what, relation, what that does to how you write. So, so Martin, you've moved to, to Brooklyn, um, and Ian's, you may not know, bought most of Gloucestershire, <laughs> <laughs> and, and is, is living there. Um, so the questions are really about if you, if you move from uh, one city to another or from the city to, to a rural um, environment, does that, have any kind of conscious impact or does it have, do you think, any effect on how you're writing? One, one question asked you if you'd ever thought about living in Staten Island before you decided to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> if you'd ever considered Staten Island before you settled on Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> no, it didn't come up. Um, but the, the answer is that you think it has no effect at all. And... Um, and indeed it doesn't, 
um, until about three years have gone by. This is Norman Mailer said of September the 11th, uh, the idea that you wanted to start a novel about this on September the 12th, that he was experienced enough and wise enough and sophisticated enough about the art of fiction to know that you, that you had to wait for it to, absorb, to be absorbed not just by your mind but by your body. It had to go all the way down the spinal cord and into your heart and into your soul. And sure enough, about three years after September the 11th, the, there was a slew of novels by Don DeLillo, um, Jay McInerney, Claire Massoud, and others about September the 11th. So, I mean, I've been here two years in America, and I, I think in about a year's time, I might have something to say about that. But um, it doesn't feel, I mean, I'm just writing what I'm writing, and the, where I am seems to have no uh, effect on that. But something is being stored up physically. Uh, we move on? I mean, you could say that for Hemingway and Fitzgerald, it had quite a lot to do. You know, but you could say that you know, for Hemingway and Fitzgerald, it had, the way they lived had quite a lot to do with the way in which their writing came out, by the European shift, I mean, um, Spain in the case of Hemingway, France in the case of Fitzgerald. Yes, but I, I wouldn't have thought immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some writers who have to get out of England, Isherwood being the obvious example, and Auden, um, for, for various class and family reasons, but it wasn't like that with me. I came out um, partly to hoping that Christopher Hitchens was going to live another few years, which he didn't do. Um, so th there was no compulsion to leave, and therefore no, no great epiphany on leaving. Mm. What do you think, you know, the location of, you know, the location of the writer and the nature of the work, do you think? Well, I'm a long way from my all of Gloucestershire novel, or most of Gloucestershire novel. <laughs> yeah, most of Gloucestershire. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it's just entirely down to the, to the book you're writing. Sometimes they float free of um, space, um, and you can't feel any connection with where you are, and that feels great. Uh, in my own experience, uh, moving back into London, into central London in 2002, uh, was a real jolt and delight, and um, I got a novel Saturday out of a, an intense relationship with a locality. Uh, the moment I'm writing a London novel from Gloucestershire. Also, I think space has, has shrunk in extraordinary ways. Uh, living in the country is not what it was. Now we have the internet and um, all the groceries come with a click of the mouse, and you know, we've abolished um, spatial relations in, in, in important ways, and we can be elsewhere. But it's true, it's interesting, you know, getting out of England uh, for someone like Isherwood, getting out of your own country can, it's either forced on you uh, or, or it's a choice as it was, say, for Joyce and Beckett becomes the necessary spur, but, you know, from Zurich, Trieste, etc., <laughs> Joyce wrote, you know, a Dublin novel, uh, he didn't need to be there. So the imagination really transcends, I think, space. Yeah, he just had his copy of the Irish Times from June the yep. 16th, 1906. And all his mates in uh, Dublin, right? And almost everything that's in the newspaper gets into the novel. Yeah, you know? that worn out yellowing yeah, copy. Including, you know, the ads. Yeah. What is life without plum trees, potted meat? <laughs> Incomplete, you know. Um, well, we're asked a question which perhaps we should take, which is uh, about the hitch. And it says it's been 17 months since your mutual friend Christopher Hitchens died. What do you think is his legacy, and do you think there are any writers poised or best or able to attempt to replace him? Um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that, um, that he's uh, a literary phenomenon and, and not a political one. Um, yeah, uh, he, was, he was too eccentric in his political judgments to, f for that to be the reason for his incredible popularity and the fact that he was so loved. Um, I think it's, it's um, you know, he personally so compelling. And just the writing is, is a delight, uh, whatever your politics. And I think 
I think in a year or two that will be clear, that, um, that he, he is a literary phenomenon. And I don't see, it's hard to see in the, in the annals of, of political commentary and literary commentary, someone like uh, him being replaced. I mean, who would you compare him with? Hazlitt, perhaps. Mm. But um, they don't come more than once a century or so. Yeah. Hazlitt, Swift, bits of Defoe, maybe, but you have to go back there. But just an essayist. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You have anything? Yeah, but some bits of Hitch that we value highly, we lose with his death, which is, I mean, he was a fantastic public speaker, uh, amazing in the art of conversation. Uh, and I agree with Martin. I mean, in his last, uh, we were, someone and I were talking about this earlier this evening, uh, as he lay dying, he had a commission to complete, which was to turn in 3,000 words on Chesterton. And his strength was fading, and his son and I helped him to a desk with all his tubes, um, various cushions, because he had such terrible bed sores. But he just had absolutely fiery determination to, to turn in this essay. And he knew a great deal about sort of internal politics of Rome and the Anglican Church that he wanted to get off his chest without the resource of, of all his books about him. That vanishes. I mean, that's what's so painful about losing a friend. You never get that combination of life and genes ever again. So, so we won't see his like. Yeah, I don't think any of us could write 3,000 words on Chesterton with the help of all the libraries of the world. No, even, really. <laughs> <laughs> even with Ritalin and... Um, uh, uh, we should say, actually, but the two books you've uh, heard reading from today, both dedicated to Christopher Hitchens. I mean, that's mm. no coincidence. So, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, mine might have been, except that I'd already dedicated one to him earlier, uh, which was Step Across This Line. So he's received books from all three of us. And I have to say, I remember when I had finished the first draft of the manuscript of my memoir, which was an enormous pile of paper, I, 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 I said to Christopher, would he, you know, I, I said, if you, want to, you know, if you want to see it by email, I'll just email it to you, because I didn't want him to have to handle this mountain of, of actual hard copy paper. But he said, no, he actually preferred it in the, in the old-fashioned form. So I mailed it to him, and I thought, you know, I didn't think he was going to read it. I just thought I just wanted him to have it, or to have a look at it, you know, put your hand on it. Um, this is, of course, to underestimate the hitch because what happened in very a very short space of time, and this is you know while he's having major chemotherapy, and very very unwell, I get back a very long email, with a detailed criticism of the text, and 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 pointing out all the mistakes, <laughs> um, including misquotations of P. G. Woodhouse, which. Nobody would ever argue with Christopher about P.G. Woodhouse. If he says you're wrong, you're wrong. You know? So, yeah, I mean, he was an extraordinary figure, and I don't see there's anybody there to fill that hole right now. Okay, we have probably time for this one more question, but here's an invitation to us to disagree. Um, apparently, I said in Joseph Anton that fiction was a form of freedom and truth. Martin is quoted in the Paris Review as saying, you don't want too much truth in fiction. You don't want too much fact. And Ian is quoted in saying, these are very erudite questions, um, in The Guardian, that fiction is a higher form of lying. So do Martin and Ian disagree with Salman? Well, I mean, let me start off by saying that I disagree with Salman. <laughs> um, because I think the great thing about fiction is that you make shit up. <laughs> so, I, no, I, I agree with someone. <laughs> um, in fact, I put it more bluntly than that. I said, fiction is, writing is freedom. And that is why um, your, your blood goes gangrenous when you think of the situation of writers in lands that are not free. And uh, I think the great illustration of this is the Soviet Union 
where a whole generation of incredibly vigorous, mad, madly talented Russian writers was wiped out. But um, what's interesting is that uh, the, the hacks could manage it. They, in fact, there was a vague relation of Tolstoy's um, who, who said, I actually love all this juggling around to make it follow the Moscow line. You know, it's, it's amusing to me. And they were fine, they flourished, um, and they dominated. But it was the, it was the writers who had talent and the, their fate, and I'm thinking of Esenin, the peasant poet, and Mayakovsky, and um, they both committed suicide. If you have talent and you compromise, then suicide is the only way out. That's how vital it is to your sort of, your, the sources of your being. Um, and I, I've never felt any diminution or um, threat or constriction of my freedom. Um, and, and that seems to me to be almost the definition of, of writing. It's odd, Martin, you should mention um, this matter of writing in relation to the Soviet Union, because I was reading today the Nobel Prize acceptance speech that Solzhenitsyn never gave. Uh, in which there was one sentence stood out, something like, woe betide the country um, whose power interferes with writers and with writing. And uh, yes, I'm going to disagree with myself. We've got to have dinner together, so we... Um, so we can go on later you know, we can go on. when you're not listening. Go on having, <laughs> go on having hysterical sex. So... <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, it, it, it's an old saw about um, poetry and fiction being kinds of lies, but that's said against the, the grain, I mean, because we know, in fact, that um, we're all looking for a, a kind of truth. And that interference in that truth uh, really comes through in Solzhenitsyn's remark. Today, I think couldn't peel myself away from this book about um, the concentration camps in North Korea called Escape from Camp 14. It's completely obsessed me. I still feel I'm, I'm sitting there with it in my hands, where all possibilities of fiction have been eliminated. There aren't just sort of lying um, toadies who uh, manage their careers through the writers' union as, as some did in the 50s. I mean, here is a scorched earth policy and, and a country beyond demoralization, uh, just ruined. And the key to that is there's no memory and no soul and it's Orwellian in the extreme, I think. Mm. I mean, just to say that it seems to me also just important to point out the, that the fictionality of fiction is one of its great values. I mean, the fact that it is stuff, that, is, that, that it is not true. You know, that Madame Bovary is untrue in the same way that a flying carpet is untrue. She didn't exist either. You know, it's not just a question of physics. Um, <laughs> everything in novels is made up, and that's the liberation of it, because it allows the imagination to act upon the real and to come up with something which hopefully is a kind of truth. All right, just final, just, this is a question which can be a, maybe even a one-word answer, um, but it's a good way to end maybe. If you could, go back and change anything in any of your books, is there anything that you would change? You can say no. <laughs> um, actually, I'd, I'd like another week with Time's Arrow. Um, I, there's something I need to fix in that. But uh, looking through the mess of my first four novels, it's just an um, Orgean task, and you've just got to let it go. Um, <laughs> but a, a scene here, a transition there, yes, but um, uh, not a, a... Some writers have rewritten their novels, and I think that's the depth of frivolity. Um, <laughs> you should always be looking forward, not back. Yeah. yeah. No, you, it's all step. You have to let it stand. It's part of the story. But if I did have the chance and I were minded to do something... I'd go and fix some of the commas in <laughs> First Love, Last Rites. I, I fell under Beckett's spell, early Beckett, um, in one or two of those stories, and I thought 
it was jolly cunning to have commas instead of full stops. Uh, now it doesn't look cunning at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing I'm going to do about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, there is a, just to give one small e example of the dangers of going back to your early work, there's a great poem of Auden's which contains the line, we must love one another or die, yeah. um, which in his later years he did have an attempt at rewriting, and he rewrote that line as, we must love one another and die. And the first line is a great line, and the second line is obvious. <laughs> and that's the problem of rewriting your own stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>